Well, we're starting on the note uh, of talking about anti-corruption. The Auditor General is this afternoon convinced that public funds allocated for the provision of meals, hot meals for that matter, at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, may have been paid to persons who have not provided any service at all. The latest infraction is contained in the comprehensive report on the audit uh, of the government of Ghana COVID-19 expenditure for the period of March 2020 to the period of uh, June 2022. Uh, in April 2020, the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection engaged caterers for the supply of hot meals and sport payments in the Greater Accra and Greater Kumasi areas as part of the COVID-19 emergency food payments program. Uh, but, of course, looking at what's uh, coming out from the latest audit from the Auditor General, there are some red flags about that hot meal that was provided. Let's get to the details for you by bringing you a breakdown of what uh, we found out. It indicates that in the heat of the COVID-19 pandemic, the government of Ghana through the Ministry of Health entered into an agreement with the United Nations Children Fund, that is UN uh, UNICEF, uh, for the procurement of COVID-19 vaccines and related supplies based on second additional credit financing of some 200,000 US dollars by the World Bank. Now, the Auditor General is stating here that, quote, we noted that the Ministry of Health on behalf of the government of Ghana paid an amount of 120,000, uh, that's 120 million US dollars, 192,379 uh, on that UNICEF VAT for the supply of 16,000 doses of vaccine. So these are some of the findings on the health front. Uh, then it continues to indicate uh, that when it comes to uh, the payment, some 38 uh, million, 322,000 US dollars were supplied to the national cold room, uh, resulting in an outstanding amount of some 81,870,000, uh, 81,879,380 uh, US dollars, uh, which was now, which is now the outstanding amount with UNICEF uh, AVT. Now, the Auditor General is pointing out that this could result in an outstanding amount under the contract. But when it comes to other issues here uh, being pointed out on the Ministry of Health, the Chief Director of the Ministry of Health explained that the amount was paid in anticipation of receiving all vaccines within the short spate of time for vaccination in the country. However, unexpected vaccine uh, donations into the country coupled with limited vaccine storage capacity and the slow uptake by Ghanaians to be vaccinated. It made it um, impossible for the full deliveries to be made. And so the Auditor General is recommending that the Chief Director makes uh, every effort to renegotiate uh, to recover the outstanding amount. Let's take you to the Ministry of Gender's uh, findings and what it is that the Auditor General is saying about the Ministry of Gender and Social Protection when it comes to the hot meal that was provided, uh, because that's where a lot of issues uh, are coming up. So this is the uh, various amounts that were paid in tranches, four tranches in all, uh, to the Gender Social Projection Ministry. On the 7th of April 2020, the first tranche of uh, 1,200,000 Ghana cities was paid uh, to the Gender Ministry. On the 9th of April 2020, the second tranche of 3.6 million cities was released and the uh, subsequent tranches in involved the one that was paid on the 17th of April 2020 uh, with some 4.2 million Ghana cities released as of that time. By the end of April, uh, specifically the 24th of April 2020, some 3 million cities was released to the Gender S Social Protection Ministry amounting to 12 million Ghana cities in all. But how did the gender ministry go about the expenditure? We'll find, find out shortly. Um, the Auditor General notes that from the records of the ministry, an amount of 7.9 million cities and also 3.9 million Ghana cities were expended in Greater Accra and Greater Kumasi, respectively for COVID-19 emergency food payment for the delivery of hot meals to poor and vulnerable people. The ministry engaged caterers, some of whom were from the school feeding program and uh, Jofel catering services, amongst others for the supply of hot meals 
and spot payments ranging between 5,000 Ghana cities and 48,000 Ghana cities, uh, which were made uh, to the service providers. Now, the, the Auditor General continues to point out that there are some findings on the Ministry of Information as well. Uh, because it talks about the fact that the president on update number five pointed out some measures on the spread of coronavirus, um, which was happened on the 5th of April 2020. Uh, the president stated clearly that some insurance packages were going to be given to frontline staff, amounting to the tune you know, of some 350,000 Ghana cities for each health personnel. But the president also indicated that all health workers will not pay taxes. Uh, on their payments, on their salaries for the next three months. That was for that period, April, May, June as well. And he further stated that all frontline health workers will receive additional allowances of 50% of their base pay per month. But in the case of the Ministry of Information, during the review of the Auditor General, they noted that senior management staff and other supporting staff of the Ministry of Information paid themselves a total amount of 151,500 Ghana cities as COVID-19 risk allowance for coming to work during the lockdown period, contrary to the above presidential directive and without approval from the Office of the Chief of Staff. And so the recommendation has been made that an amount of 150,500 Ghana cities uh, should be recovered from the beneficiary staff and paid to the Auditor General's recoveries account. Based on these findings, a lot has been happening this week as well. The Public Accounts Committee has also been sitting. So it's a good time to hear from Daniel Yao Domelevo, former Auditor General, who's joining us uh, in a conversation here on The Pulse. Happy New Year, sir, and welcome to The Pulse. Thank you very much. Many, many happy returns to you. Well, I'm sure that you've seen some of the findings. At the time you left office, uh, you expressed interest in at least commissioning some sort of an audit into the COVID-19 expenses. Uh, looking at some of these latest findings and what we are learning of, are you satisfied uh, or you feel there's more that we should be doing to probe this matters? Uh, thank you very much. Yes, as you said, I was going to actually audit the COVID expenditure in 2020 before leaving office. This is because the uh, novel coronavirus uh, and COVID-19 Act, which is at 1013, <clears throat> requires the Auditor General to audit the financial statements relating to their revenue and expenditure and report on it within six months after the end of the financial year. So we're preparing to do that before I left. And I, I must say that uh, I commend uh, uh, the Auditor General and his team for the work done. But it is sad that we are seeing this level of wastage at a time where there are no fiscal space as a result of which even people who lent money to government cannot be paid. However, people are wasting government money this way. It is, it's sad to say the least. Uh, do you feel we should be doing more? And I guess that's uh, a more precise one there. Exactly. We should be doing more. Uh, more in different fronts. One, there should be consequences for these infractions. If we do thousand audits and there are no consequences, people are going to continue with this uh, impunity. So I think and I recommend that there must be consequences uh, uh, consequences or people must be held accountable so that we can avoid the recurrence of this. We, I also expect that uh, in line with the provisions of the at 13, uh, 1013 that I referred to, uh, there is the need to have an annual audit on this uh, COVID uh, fund, trust fund. And so we are waiting for that uh, a, a report also. Uh, looking at the report that was issued by the Auditor General, a very good report with good findings, and I commend him and his team for it. But I'm confused. I don't know whether this report was in satisfaction of the requirement of that act, 
or it is in requirement in, in satisfaction of section 16 or in satisfaction of article 187 of the constitution because uh, when i read the report i get a bit confused about it if you read the second page of the report it says it's coming under uh, section 16 of the audit service act which is a special audit but the transmitter letter which went to the speaker of parliament says he is using his mandate under Article 187, and also based upon a request from the speaker. So I was like, oh, okay. The speaker asked the auditor general to do this audit. Then I go to the beginning of the audit report, the summary, and it says it is based upon the Article 187 and a request from Minister of Finance, not the speaker. Mm. So I was like, there's a lack of consistency here, which I think if he corrects it, it will help all of us to know exactly where are the uh, where is the request coming from and mm. what mandate he's using. Right. Now, as I'm saying this because if he is depending upon the Article 187, as stated in the transmitter letter and the letter to the speaker, then I don't think lumping several financial years together is in order because Article 187 clause 5 requires the Auditor General to produce at the end of each financial year the report and submit it to Parliament within six months. So if it is that provision, uh, those provisions that, that it is depend upon, then I think the report itself has a problem. But if he's going under Section 16 of the Audit Service Act, then that one is okay, except that the reporting of this in his report is not consistent. But that is just the form. Mm. The substantive issue is that there are serious infractions. In fact, you just mentioned a lot of them. One of them which intrigued me was uh, the situation where Ministry of Health have contracted uh, a finance ag a lease agreement for 15 million and over, uh, which is covering 25 good years. My goodness, why would you do that? And even here is the case, there was no feasibility studies or nobody went to check whether the facility was fit for purpose. And after this agreement, we are told 20 point something million is going to be used in reformatting or reshaping the place. And I'm like, who in his normal sense will do this? If not because people are getting away with infraction. So uh, I think we can do more from both the other side and also enforcing the findings of the audit. I, I, I'll tell you what I also feel about what's happening to this document. And one has got to do with your track record on surcharge. I need to bring that up because I recall as many as 112 surcharges uh, raking in over 67 million cities to government chest. It was the reason for which you were adjudged the integrity personality of the year 2019 by the Ghana Integrity Initiative. What do you feel is accounting for this inability of the audit service now to go ahead and exercise that constitutional mandate? First and foremost, let me say that whenever this disallowance and search charge is mentioned, uh, the 112 or whatever certificates come to the fore. But I think the most significant thing which happened was the disallowance of 5.4 billion, which is money that government should have paid. And we disallowed that. I thought that should be remembered always. <laughs> There's right. a whole report on that. Mm. Uh, as to why there is no disallowance or surcharges uh, recently, I think the, per the best person to uh, answer that should be the Auditor General. Remember the Constitution under Article 187 plus 7B <clears throat> provides that the Auditor General in the performance of his function can disallow any item, in fact, he used the word may, disallow any item of expenditure which is contrary to law and surcharge the people responsible. And that is what I sought to do because I thought if there are no consequences for the infractions, the culture of impunity will continue. So that is what I sought to do and I know for sure that the current Auditor General, Mr. Johnson, as you do, uh, is more than capable of uh, doing the same. Maybe uh, they may, he may have some challenges which I am not aware of, but I thought 
Uh, but I think that by the time I left office, the mechanisms and the institutional arrangements were in place, which he can, he can use to do same. Yeah, but, but you want him to go ahead and search out, do you? Of course, yes. In fact, I was waiting to hear that following this report, these people who are misusing money have been surcharged. Because if we don't do that, we can continuously audit. He can send his people thousand and one times on the field, but we will continue getting these infractions. And even people get emboldened, uh, emboldened because they think that nothing is going to happen as a result of this audit. So uh, I, I, it is my wish and my expectation that those that you say refer refund should go ahead, serve them with notice of intention to disallow and say charge and say charge them. If they are not happy, they should go to court. It doesn't matter whether they go to court or they don't go to court. Uh, uh, it, it is quite deterrent. And if they go to court, well, they may win, they may not win. They, the auditor general may lose some of the cases, may win some of the cases, but that is the name of the game. But some say you paid the price for it. And you vividly recall the Kroll and Associates case, for instance. It was part of the reasons that CSOs, in a collective statement issued, were of the opinion that you, you were forced out of office. So if you're asking your successors, those succeeding you, to take up your course, they may suffer the same fate, isn't it? Yeah, it's very interesting uh, development because... Uh, uh, it's not every public servant or any, every auditor general would like to uh, face uh, the consequences of doing his work as it is supposed to be. You talked about CSOs issuing a statement. You've forgotten they even filed a suit at the Supreme Court. And the APS Court of Ghana, up to today, has not even decided that case. It's of no importance to the Supreme Court that these type of things can happen. However, it is the same Supreme Court in Occupy Ghana versus Attorney General. That directed that the Auditor General must discharge these duties and responsibilities. So if that has happened and there's a problem, I thought the first thing the Supreme Court should do is to expedite action and come bring it to a closure for us to know where the Auditor General should go and where he should not go, so that that can guide my successes. But that is also in a limbo. And for that matter, I think that can contribute or maybe one of the reasons why he's exercising uh, precaution because the accounts have it that the tree that Anansi dies under in Tikuma the sun does not go and sleep under it. So maybe that is why. I, and, uh, and there was just this thing about your personality. Some say, well, stubborn academy, if I could use that word. Uh, but it was much more of courage and um, saying truth to power as it is. For those who work in, I mean, institutions, state institutions that have to exercise supervisory uh, roles over uh, public expenditure, where should they be drawing their inspiration from? And, and I'm just wondering where you drew yours from at the time. Well, you know, we all have uh, different approaches or values when it comes to some of these things. Mm. I believe that I, I better do what I think is, is right, damn the consequences. And I don't really bother myself to think about what may happen to me. Because I have a notion that uh, the work in the public service, when it comes to an end, my life has not come to an end. I think there is life beyond the public service. So you, all, you only have to move on. And all these office holders, especially the Auditor General, he took an, uh, an oath of office and read what the oath of office says. It binds him to do what the laws requires without fear or favor, without uh, affection or ill will. So that is what I thought not only him, but all similar office holders uh, should do. But well, it's very difficult to talk for someone. So please, you may be kind enough to ask him what are the challenges he's facing? Maybe I'm oblivious of those challenges so that we all know. I remember I was outside the country, but I saw some demonstrations last year uh, to his office asking him to disallow and say that I saw people who I know very well, uh, prominent people. Uh, but uh, I, it has still not, maybe it, maybe it has happened and I don't know. If it has not happened, 
then I think it is something uh, disturbing or keeping him from it. It is good you reach out to him and mm. find out that. Yeah, yeah, but I'm asking that question because of the succeeding generations of person who, persons who look up to you. Uh, you. I recall you indicating that when you fight corruption, corruption will fight back. But I'm just wondering where you are still keeping and taking that inspiration form that should guide others. Yes, it's, it's like I knew the consequences of doing the right thing. Mm. Because the norm in the public service or in Ghana is that everybody is bending the rules. So they expect the Auditor General to also bend the rules. And corruption in particular, wherever you fight it, it will also fight you. It's not limited to Ghana. It has fought several people around the globe. I knew this very well because I've been in public financial management for several years and I knew that it was going to fight me. So it did not come to me as a surprise. But my encouragement to people who come after me is that that is not the end of the road. It is never the end of the road. As you are being uh, uh, maybe subjected to all sorts of unfair treatments, allegations, manipulations from the highest office that you can think of, uh, they are rather marketing you. So others may be looking or hearing your story and may be ready to accept you to continue working with them or life, um, uh, the, the life of a professional goes beyond serving in the public service. So my encouragement to everyone is just do your work, do it well. Don't be too much afraid of the consequences the worst that may happen is that you are removed from office. Uh, some say, what about if they kill you? I say, well, even death, we are all going to die one day. So when I was in office, I didn't I did say it. So I didn't care if I may have to lose my life for doing my work. And for, so we may have to sacrifice for Mother Ghana. If everybody says, let me just protect myself, insulate myself from attacks and whatnot from the corrupt group or the powers that be, then Ghana is not going to go anywhere. Look at where we are as at now. Our fiscals are very terrible. We don't have any fiscal space. And yet, the rot is going on. And you will expect that the government will be at the forefront to say, whoever spent a CD unlawfully should return it, even before the Auditor General comes in. Because there is an institution which we call internal audit. I am very sure that many of these findings have been unearthed by the internal audit before the external auditors came. If they couldn't unearth it, then it means the internal audit is weak. Weak not because the people are not professional. Weak because their independence is impaired. Weak because they are not well financed, they are not resourced, and they are under the very people they are checking. So the institutional arrangement for internal audit to function well has not been done. And I'm aware there is a draft law, which I've, I've read and I was very happy with, but where is that law now? It has not, I don't know whether it has even reached parliament before it will be passed into law. So my encouragement to public servants who are doing their work well is that don't think that the end of your service is the end of your life. There is life beyond public service. Thank you. Coincidentally, the Public Accounts Committee seatings are equally underway, and some of those documents, I'm sure, uh, you, you supervised them as well. Uh, but it's the same old case, same old case of corruption, of misapplication of funds, and I'm just wondering if this could ever end. Where do we start off from? Uh, from my point of view, I've made it clear that if there are no consequences for misbehavior, misbehavior will continue. We can have all those layers, having the internal audit, external auditors, public accounts committee, bring in the special prosecutor, bring in the attorney general, bring in uh, Yoko, whatever. If all of this will just be uh, uh, dancing around and nothing substantive happens, then people get emboldened, and for that matter, they will continue with it. With the Public Accounts Committee, let me say that I admire the work that they are doing. I had the opportunity to listen to one of their sittings. Uh, I think the IGP and etc. were uh, at that sitting. And I was like, this is great, because uh, if you were a stranger and you came into that meeting or tune in, it was going to be difficult to determine which member is in opposition and which one is in government. 
because they were all taking their work seriously and I think I must pat them on the back. However, two things. One, the time it takes before the Public Accounts Committee uh, uh, sit on the audit report is too long because uh, findings may take a year, two years or more before they do it. I'm aware that they were putting in measures to catch up, but they've not caught up. Why? Because of the second reason. They don't have funding. Most of their sittings are funded by donors. I don't know whether it is still the case. When I was in office, most of the times they have to get a financier, somebody to fund their sitting. This is a core mandate or core activity of public financial management, and there must be a budget for it so that they can do their work and do it well. And beyond that, they must be able to call into question even the Minister of Finance, because the PFM Act requires that there must be a status update from the Minister of Finance on how the recommendations or the audit finding recommendations uh, supplied by or decided on by the Public Accounts Committee have been addressed. They must, there must be an update or a report and also, there is a provision also on Attorney General, who is also supposed to give the same type of update and give a copy to the Auditor General and copy to uh, and write to the Parliament. These are all not forthcoming because they don't have the resources, they don't have the time, and the, 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 their time are also limited. They have other shadows and activities to do. I'm full of commendation for them, but I wish they could uh, speed, it, uh, speed, it up, speed up the process and make it a bit more timely so that we don't in 2023 be talking about what happened in 2020 or 2019. Thank you. Let's look at the solutions then. Where do we start from in terms of the approach? Uh, very often the focus is on the political class and yet some are on the other side, the other divide with the opinion that we have a group of corrupt civil servants who are always tagging the political class, a reason for which we are not able to fight graft. What's your target? My target is the political class more than the, the public servants. Because I know, I've been, and mind you, before becoming Auditor General, I've been a public servant for 18 years. I've worked in Accountant General's Department for 18 years. So I know that most of the things done by the public servants are done under the supervision or coercion of the political leaders. But some of them, they do it themselves. It has nothing to do with the political leaders. However, if we are holding the uh, account uh, holder, that is the minister responsible, I'm sure the minister will ensure that everything down there is clean. Assuming, assuming, assuming that the audit report came up, I saw something uh, issued on behalf of the president or by the president, and the president gave directly and said, look, if you want to remain in my cabinet, then you have three weeks to clear all the issues raised in, your, in your, the audit report for your ministry. And if you are not able to do that within three weeks and recover monies which must be recovered, etc., you are no more part of my government, I am sure that the minister will go call his chief director and give, give him or her the marching orders and it will bring sanity to the system. So the bank stops on the table of the political leaders. If they show tolerance for abuse and misuse of public funds, of course, when they are stealing, the public servants are aware. Don't uh, doubt the intelligence of uh, public servants. They are aware of what their seniors do. But even if the seniors don't do it, and they, they, they look away and make sure that the rot continues, then we may have to blame them as well. So I think that we may have to ensure that, in fact, if you want to fight corruption, you can't fight corruption by looking at those down there. You must hit the top man because one of the key things in fighting corruption is to bring deterrence into the system. If they look at it and say that uh, even the chief executive has not been spared, then well, how will we spare you the storekeeper? So the storekeeper will be careful. Even if he has not yet stolen, if he had planned to steal, he may stop the stealing. So I think we must look at both, but emphasis must be at the top. Because in public financial management, I argue and maintain that it storms at the top and drizzles at the bottom. So you want to pay attention to where it is storming. 
it is at the top. If you look at the expenditure at the top, it can cover several small, small expenditures which we go after, which at times does not even reduce value for money. Mm. Daniel Domelevo, what, what is it about COVID-19 that has provided that breeding ground for, for corruption to fester? It is not about COVID-19 per se. It is about uh, uh, the pandemic. In any situation where there is an emergency, uh, public servants who are already hungry and ready to abuse public funds take advantage of that. And uh, the rules are relaxed. I hope you notice that if you saw the audit report, you saw several expenditures that were accredited only by, uh, what do you call it, certificate of honor. I used to call it certificate of dishonor. They still call it honor. <laughs> I, I think it's a very dishonest certificate. People steal money, collect the money, put in their pocket, and issue certificate for you and say, this is a certificate of honor. So in such situations, in fact, to be honest with you, under such emergencies, the accountability me mechanism should have also changed. It should not be business as usual. The audit should have happened several years ago. At the end of 2000, we should, uh, 2020, we should have had an audit report. 2020, uh, 2021, we should have had another report. So that the frequency and, again, the sanctions that go with it would deter people from the abuses. If you look at, um, I think, the money paid in Sugakov, uh, in Adaklu, or right. something of that nature. Right. I think it happened as far back as April 2020. Mm. And if this, there were to be an audit a report at the end of 2020, and this was discovered, maybe it would have been corrected long ago mm. than doing that in 2023. Yeah, but it was also the case, even when it came to the distribution of free food, do, do you feel that, that that should, I mean, it's time we do away with certificates of honor? Uh, because in the case of the free food, the fear of the Auditor General is people may not have provided services, and yet because they issued that certif certificate, uh, you are not able to hold them to account then? Yes, uh, the manner and the modus operandi of sharing those food by itself was, a prob was problematic. Uh, accepted, admittedly, we have never gone through that before. So I think maybe it is a learning curve for us or a learning event for us all. But there may be, God forbid, another pandemic in years to come. So this is time that we must sit down and look at what should be the procurement processes or procedures. What should be the financial management arrangements? What should be the distribution? What should be the accountability mechanisms? So to ensure that we save lives, but at the same time, so mitigate against abuses of public funds. So it is incumbent on the Auditor General, the Accountant General, Ministry of Finance, and the key stakeholders to come together and say, look, what are the lessons learned from COVID-19? And God forbid, in case something of that nature or magnitude is going to happen again, what account accountability mechanisms should we put in place? so that people don't take advantage of that and yeah. abuse or misuse right uh, i just want to pick up on th two issues before we wrap up uh, the, the first one starting off on uh, one of one of the statements made by the uh, special prosecutor recently uh, you are passionate about corruption so i'll ask you about it he says as a nation we're not serious about fighting corruption you agree I don't understand that statement. What does it mean? That we have put the mechanisms in place, but we are not serious about it. His office was established, but we are not serious about it. I don't really understand what that means. Maybe some individuals are not interested in fighting the corruption. But if the nation as a whole does not want to fight corruption, we will not enact such laws, such as the one which mandate Auditor General to search out. We will not have come out with a law which mandates his office to perform and etc. So maybe I, have, I didn't hear what he said, but maybe he's been quoted out of context. I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe there's some frustration on his way. He expected some support, which he's not receiving. But then I think no normal human being would like corruption because corruption is one disease 
which is eating all of us more than any other disease. The number of people dying in our hospitals because of corruption are uncountable. The number of people who get accident on our roads and die because of corruption are uncountable. The number of students or children whose future is lost because of corruption, they can't get good education, etc., are plenty. Corruption is a disaster. And for that matter, for a country or a group of people or a nation to say we are not ready to fight it means we are calling for our doom. Mm. Uh, and very finally, you may no longer be the Auditor General, but your opinion uh, matters. There is, um, of course, the concern that we look into public funds being allocated uh, to government's flagship National Cathedral project. Uh, just as the COVID, many believe that that project is shrouded in a lot of um, secrecy. What's your take on the need for us to have state institutions uh, or even your successor at the Auditor General's Department take up that matter and probe how public funds are being expended on that project? Let me say first and foremost that uh, this is my opinion and uh, it is not an audit opinion. I have not gone into every detail of that case, but I find that expenditure or that transaction very, very unfortunate. At no point in time should we be using public funds to, to fund individual people's wish or desire. So if the president has a desire to put up a, a, a cathedral for God, he should go ahead and look for his money, but not to use public funds. But even if he has to use public funds, the constitution has laid down procedure of using public funds, especially money from the consolidated fund. Article 178 provides that it must be in the budget or in a supplementary budget approved by parliament, except if it is a charge on the appropriation by a law that is the constitution or an act of parliament. This was not done. Again, we were told that it was an emergency as a result of which the Minister of Finance used the emergency, uh, what do you call it, emergency vote in making that payment. At the same time, the, the same Minister of Finance requested that there should be money paid into the contingency fund. Read the Auditor General's report, it's there, that 1.2 million was paid into contingency fund, not the vote, and used for COVID which is clearly an emergency, an unforeseeable as, uh, expenditure. So if the cathedral was actually an unforeseeable expenditure, which occurred, it should have been coming out of the contingency fund, not the vote. Why didn't it come from there? Because the contingency fund is under the supervision of the Finance Committee of Parliament. So there will be transparency and accountability there. So they went in for this black box called uh, contingency vote, and use that instead. Again, the constitution provides that the minister, if he will not even use contingency fund, he must submit a supplementary budget to parliament. There again, there will be accountability and transparency. To avoid this, the government decided to use contingency vote, which I must admittedly say has been in the books for several years. And it gives the ministers, the various ministers of finance, a leeway of putting money there and can use it anyhow. And I call on parliament to disallow that expenditure line. They should cancel it. It is unlawful. The constitution has provided medium for which the government should address contingencies or unexpected expenditures. They are two. One of them utilizing the vote under the contingency fund, which must be replenished. Secondly, the minister can go to parliament with supplementary budget. If they will not do this, then they should not allow them. If you look at the budget for 2023, 20, uh, you see that the amount is colossal. I, I didn't know you were going to ask me a question on it. I will have quoted it for you. But look at the projection for 2024 going. It go, it's going to the tune, I think by 2026, it will be about 14 billion. And why do we have to create such a contingency? where there is no transparency on it, there's no accountability for it, you only spend money. One day you hear that Daniel Domenico has been built a house, and you ask, Minister, where did you get the approval from? He said he took it from contingency boot. It is a window for stealing, it is a window for wastage, and must be stopped. Thank you very much. Well, uh, we're wrapping up. Any message for those in authority in terms of dealing with corruption? 
Yes, uh, I would like to plead with them that we cannot do otherwise. Uh, we know corruption is endemic in the system, but then we cannot develop without keeping an eye on corruption. So they should do whatever is possible to arm or resource the Office of the Auditor General, the Special Prosecutor, the uh, Yoko, all the anti-corruption uh, fighting institutions so that we can sustain the fight. And also they should help them with the a justice implementation system so that if you go to uh, the case go to court it must be heard we have some cases on corruption they just go and sit in the court and nothing happens i i, I, I see that i see that you want the chief justice to act fast on that case yes uh, he's one of the people who i think if you hear me we should try and uh, prioritize corruption issues because Corruption issues are national issues. It doesn't affect one person. It's not an individual issue. It is affecting the country at, uh, at times at large. So you should prioritize uh, issues pertaining or relating to corruption so that uh, we have value for our money. I'm grateful. Daniel Yao Domelevo, thank you for spending time with us here on The Pulse.